Okay, so this is kind of a continuation of the last teaching I put out, and already I don't remember what the title of it was, but basically dealing with fasting, King Jehoshaphat and all. So a lot of the teachings that I do cover the benefits of being in agreement with God, living for him, and doing according to the instruction of the Bible. And people, when they come to church, they're looking for the benefits that they've heard about. But the thing is, it's in the writing all over the place, wherever you look. There's preconditions, and this is for both the benefit and the punishment, the blessing and the curse. And so the this line of study here on my channels is to make this clear. People disagree with it. I've had supposed ministers say, uh, telling me, uh, well, it's for everybody. Uh, the, it doesn't matter what, what your sins are. They're all forgiven. It's like if you, if you claim Jesus, uh, it, it's like uh, everything's okay. No, that's not what's in the Bible. The Bible is very plain. So the benefits are in the writing, and it's like a book of instruction. It's a legal, it's a legal book, a legal contract. Um, God does not vary away from his word. He esteems his word above his name. That's also in the writing of scriptures, if you suppose ministers ever care to look for it. Um, that way, if you know what the Bible says, and you actually do according to what the Bible says, then you won't be contradicted. So, the writing of the word of God is against you, all you who teach things other than what the Bible says. And if you try to twist the scripture, the Bible is also against you, just to put it plainly. But anyway, what this is, this is dealing with faith, faith being action. It's not sitting and expecting something for nothing. Because God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, this he will also reap. What you put in is what you're going to get out of it. And when you sow into good ground, you get a manifold harvest. That's the pattern of creation. And what is good ground? Those who do according to the word. The parable of the seed sower is also known as the parable of the soils. The good ground is what yields the most plenteous harvest. And so, those who are according to Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 20, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and Romans chapter 10, verses 8 to 13. Put those three together, those three scriptures, as the basis of that statement. So... That should give you a decent gauge of things and what is excusable, what is allowable, and what is not. You can't do the things that the Bible speaks against and expect to see the reward of faith, of doing the word, of being according to the writing of the scriptures. So, you have to do according to the instruction, if you're going to see the desired result of that instruction. I don't know how to get around the things. People watch these videos of ministers, and then they do contrary to what the Word of God says in their life and living, and then they go whining when they don't get the benefit. Um, that That's because God cannot go apart from His Word. Well, what about grace? I posted some teachings because I try to put it very plainly, but I come off as being rough and harsh with most people. Jonathan Shuttlesworth, even though he has a similar way with words, he actually explains it a lot better than I can. And I've posted his videos on one of my recent YouTube videos in, the, in like the comments, and then it's also on my Facebook page. So... Two different teachings on grace, what grace can do and what grace can't do. It's very plain in the Bible. Because God cannot get around his word, he has to do according to what he has said because he is truth. Yes, he's a person, yet he's a real tangible being who is on the throne above all creation. But he is truth 
and he is holy, and he is righteous. He cannot let wickedness continue. He has to punish it. And according to creation, which is according to his spoken word, according to his mind, who he is, his character, sin is a finite thing, and invariably it will die. And those who continue in sin will likewise perish. And there is only tribulation and anguish. The joy and the peace of the Lord, those are benefits of covenant with him. It doesn't exist in those who dwell in sin. They may think they have it, but also confusion and delusion are the fruit of sin. They may think they have the real deal, but they don't. And they are still perishing. They are still experiencing hardship, lack, poverty, no peace, constant pain, internal turmoil, those are the fruit of sin. The fruit of righteousness is joy and peace and the unbreakable strength of God where a person doesn't move no matter what's going on around them. They are able to stay constant and stay on course. So that's part of what this teaching gets into on faith. So 2 Kings chapter 5 verses 1 to 14. So 2 Kings chapter 5 verses 1 to 14. And hopefully I'm a little bit more expressive and energetic today. Unlike the last teaching I did where I was half asleep. Speaking in a dull monotone with barely any expression at all. So, let's see, 2 Kings. Should be before the Chronicles. 2 Kings chapter 5. Verses 1 to 14. Now Naaman, a captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. And he was also a mighty man of valor, but he had leprosy. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away cap captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she wa waited on Naaman's wife, and she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, if he were with... Uh, the prophet that is in Samaria, he would be able to cure a Naaman of his leprosy. And so one went in and told his Lord, one of the Lord's servants, saying, Thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go, go to, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. This is the King James Version. The language is hard to understand. It's Shakespearean and all over the place. So, he departed and took with him ten talents of sil silver and six thousand pieces of gold. And so I'm going to use a different translation here that's easier to understand than the old, old English. That's the King James Version. I need to get a new King James Version, which is a KJV in modern English. Some of the KJV nuts out there say that anything other than the old, old 1611 version uh, sends a person to hell, but um, I like to understand what I'm reading. So, so starting from verse 1 again, the king of Syria had a high admiration for Naaman, the commander-in-chief of his army, for he led his troops to many glorious victories. So he was a great hero, but he was a leper. Bands of Syrians had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a little girl who had been given Naaman's wife as a maid. One day the little girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the little girl had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king had told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to carry to the king of Israel. And so Naaman started out taking gifts of silver and gold ten suits of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, The man bringing this letter is my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read it, he tore his clothes and said, This man sends me a, a leper to heal. Am I God that I can uh, kill and give life? He is the only... He is only trying to get an excuse to invade us again. But when Elisha the prophet heard about the king of Israel's plight, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet of God here in Israel. So Naaman arrived with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's home. 
Elisha sent a messenger out to tell him to go and wash in the Jordan River seven times and he would be healed of every trace of his leprosy. But Naaman was angry and stalked away. Look, he said, I thought at least he would come out and talk to me. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call upon the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Isn't the Abana River and the Farper River of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel put together? If it's rivers I need, I'll wash at home and get rid of my leprosy. So he went away in a rage, but his officers tried to reason with him and said, If the prophet told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says to simply go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the prophet had told him to. And his flesh became as healthy as a child's, and he was healed. Then he and his, he and his entire party went back to find the prophet, and they stood humbly before him. And Naaman said, I know at last there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Now please accept my gifts. So, God is outside of our plans and our reasonings. So, when he tells you to go do something that seems crazy or out of what you expect or reason out, know that in humility and obeying God, there is the reward, the blessings of covenant with him are on the other side of it. Obedience will bring victory and breakthrough. God's word does not ever fail. And Isaiah chapter 55 speaks to that. It does not return to him empty. It accomplishes the purpose to which it is sent. He is not a man that he should lie, or the son of a man that he should re repent of his word. He esteems his word above his name. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then even Jonah tried to run from God. But he was called by God to be his prophet, and he had to obey, and he saw God glorified. And it wasn't according to his expectation. He was actually angry at God that the people that he was sent to prophecy against, when they heard that prophecy, they repented. They humbled themselves, they fasted, and God spared them. So, Daniel... Er, Daniel chapter 6. So, going to Daniel chapter 6. Ah, wrong direction. Okay, Daniel chapter 6. There it is. Or, there it was. All right. So, so this is where the the governors of Babylon got the king to make a law that people had to worship only the king. And Daniel did not obey it. He actually opened the windows of his house and prayed to God loudly. Three times per day, the, the, the people that set this up against Daniel then reported it to the king. The king threw Daniel in the lion's den. God sent an angel to protect Daniel when he was in the lion's den. The next day, the king comes, finds him alive, lifts him out, and throws the uh, people that made this decree into the lion's den, and the lions tore them to pieces. So, David got established in high position in Babylon through his obedience to God, and was therefore in a key position for the deliverance of Israel interceding for them, and... Having the king's ear and the king's successor was uh, was prophesied against by him, uh, Belteshazzar or something like that. The guy that saw the writing on the on the wall had Dan Daniel come and translate, and uh, 
Yeah, he was killed that very night. And then, so it's all there. So, those are just some examples. So looking onward in my notes here. plan of the wicked became their own snare. Daniel's enemies are eliminated. Daniel is elevated. God is glorified in the whole kingdom. Then John chapter 14 verse 12, greater things than these signs shall follow those that believe. And then this ties into Philippians chapter 4 verses 4 to 9, learning to be content, not to abandon the vision, the dream, not to abandon faith, living it out. Do not complain or despair. For the power of the tongue is that of life and death, and those who enjoy it will eat the fruit thereof. And Matthew chapter 21, verses 21 to 22, speak to the mountain, and it will move. If you believe anything is possible, um, and you ask in line with the will of God, you're going to have it. So, going to Matthew chapter 21, because it might actually have it written better than... I guess that paraphrasing or whatever. So, going to Matthew chapter 21. Verse 21. If you have faith and don't doubt, you can do things like this and much more. You can even say to this, Mount of Olives, move over into the ocean, and it will. You can ask for anything, and you'll... Receive it if you believe. Living Bible paraphrased. Another interesting translation. I like how it puts some things, but... There's a scripture in Matthew. This kind does not come out but by prayer and fasting. It seems to be at least omitted in the NLT. So what I'm finding is that I've been looking up the New King James Version Bible, and it seems to be right in line with the Old King James Version, but it's in modern English. So... But... That's where this is at, so. It's stepping out in faith, believing God's word, obeying the instruction, and you'll see the result. It's a very simple thing. Unfortunately, there's some confused people out there that somehow got into positions of ministry over the body of Christ and they're just destroying what God, how God does things, his word. Um, they think that they, in their extremely finite intellect and wisdom, know more than Almighty God and try to reinterpret his holy scriptures and go against what he said with this sloppy, agape, uh, grace covers everything, you don't need to do anything your own self, no discipline, no discipleship, no effort at all. You'll just go sliding into the kingdom of God on a downhill track into the fire. So uh, uh, it, it's uh, extremely self-contradicted, doesn't make sense, and the writing of the Bible states otherwise, very plainly. Even with uh, many different translations I've already looked into, and even the Shakespearean English of the old King James Version Bible, the 1611, even with what little of it I understand, it still speaks against these things. So I have no idea where a lot of these people get this stuff from, but when you obey the writing of the scriptures, you're going to see the results of obedience to God. It starts with knowing Jesus. Of course, you need him, you need to be saved, you need to have his word written in you. And how is this done? If you confess Jesus as Lord with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I'm going to Romans chapter 10, verses 8 to 13. So 
God willing, I'll be able to read it out of the King James Version here. So, see how this goes. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 to 13. But what does it say? What does it say? The word is near you, even in your own mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. That if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between Jew or Gentile, for the same Lord is rich unto all who call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You are whosoever. As it is also written in the scriptures, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man who commits sin. And the devil has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. Wickedness is of the devil, but God blesses those who are his. And the way creation is, the way it's written, even the very creation, the actions of sin, if you read Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 26, what's involved in those categories of sin, even 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, what is involved in those already carry their own penalty. And... With the way people are wired, and it's according to God's design, they are averse to those wicked acts, naturally. And it's when they have a devil in them that compels them to commit these wicked and costly acts that destroy their lives. That That's how it works. And so, Jesus came that all who call on him and live for him will have life and life abundant. And God blesses his children. When you live for him, you have the benefits of the covenant. And even living according to the righteous standard, those very things also carry the benefit according to the writing of creation. If you're a good steward of what you have, you'll have plenty in your household for your family and even to bless others with. But if you live loosely, you're not going to have much. You'll have holes in your bag. You're going to be paying off the, the law. You're going to be paying off those who you fooled around with. You're going to be losing things to thieves, to the devourer. Uh, your lack of maintenance on what you have means it falls apart because everything in this creation is in a state of decay. We're not in perfection yet. We're not in eternity. Creation has fallen, and it's falling apart. I'm sure that is very clear. But also, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the Apostle Peter even says, you need to repent of your sin. To repent means you turn around. You depart from the way you've been going. And so, when you repent from sin, you're departing from wicked ways. And so, the fear of the Lord, that is, reverence of him, that's the beginning of wisdom, but to depart from evil is understanding. When you understand his word, you're departing from evil. You're putting your faith into action and abiding by that righteous standard. So, that's what that points to. And even with Romans chapter 10, Cornelius and his household, they received the Holy Spirit even before they were baptized, but that's because they were righteous people living according to the scriptures, according to the instruction of the word of God, even though that all they had was the Old Testament at that point, they were still living according to it. They were being generous, they were blessing others, they were living for God, they were staying away from sin, and they were eager, they were hungry for the Lord and the things of God, and they were happily receiving the word of the Lord through the Apostle Peter. And so God came to them and filled them, and they had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so the Apostle Peter says, Why should we withhold water for these people to be baptized when they receive the same gift of God that we have? And so it became clear to them that God is no respecter of persons, whether they be Jews, whether they be Gentiles, 
all are the same in his sight. And the church gets grafted into that olive tree, which is Israel, and they are partakers of the Abrahamic covenants and the other covenants because God builds. He doesn't destroy, he doesn't wipe things away. He only did that with the old world because the thoughts of men were wicked continually and only eight people were found to be righteous, those of Noah's own household. So God saved them, but wiped out the rest to start over to ensure that what he had spoken is the way it goes. So he esteems his word above his name. He is not a man that he should lie or the son of a man that he should repent of his word. His word is going to accomplish what it is sent to do. So, you need Jesus. It's very clear. He is the way of salvation. John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life, and nobody comes unto the Father but through me. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 describe how Jesus is the Word of God. And then in John chapter 10, verse 30. He says that I and my Father are one. And the rest of the Gospel of John is good reading. 1 John is good reading. And the Epistle of James is also good reading. If you do those three to start with, on your journey with the Lord through life, you'll do well. And be sure to diligently study all the scriptures as you are led to by him. So, Lord, if... These people have not yet received you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. I pray they will do so now, do a quick work in their hearts, that they say this prayer and receive you. So all of you, repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sin, wash me and cleanse me, set me free. Jesus, thank you that you died for me. I believe that you are risen from the dead and that you're coming back again for me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Give me a passion for the lost and a hunger for the things of God and a holy boldness to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm forgiven, and I'm on my way to heaven because I have Jesus in my heart. Amen. So, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I tell you today that your sins are forgiven and always rem remember to run to him and not from him, because he loves you. He has an awesome plan for your life. It might not follow the pattern you think it should, but at the end of it, should you be diligent to stay in him and do, and do according to what his word says, you're going to see the prosperity of your future as being a child in his house, enjoying all the benefits of covenant with him, all the blessing, the overflow, because everything that the Bible teaches is true. People seem to like to quit when it gets hard. They like to go the easy route, but the scriptures are very plain and how the easy route drops you straight into the lake of fire. The way is narrow, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, but broad is the way to destruction, the very words of Jesus. And it's not money that is evil and corrupts people, it's the love of it that causes people to go into sin in pursuit of it. But when you pursue him, he will bless you. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 28, it plainly states how it works. People don't like that because it also points out how you have to do according to the instruction of the Bible. But that's how you see the benefit. And I am careful to point that out every single time interesting that so many who call themselves ministers disagree with it but that is how it is and i'm staying with what the bible teaches so i hope that helps you god bless you